Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Charlotte Williams. I'm Associate Professor and Director of the Center on Community Philanthropy here at the Clinton School of Public Service. Thank you for joining us for our public program um, this afternoon. You're in for quite a treat. Uh, we have a wonderful individual who's going to be doing the presentation. I get the honor of getting a chance to introduce um, the young lady who will be introducing our public program speaker this morning. Abby Olivier is a graduate of um, see. Old Miss. She's a graduate of Old Miss and has been working here at the Clinton School and is about to graduate with her master's in public service degree. Abby has done incredible work during her time here at the Clinton School, and she just completed her capstone project working with the Arkansas Insurance Department, doing a whole study about best practices and best approaches to enrolling individuals in the National Health Care Act. She'll be presenting her findings this Friday at 9.20 a.m., so if you're available, please join us for her presentation. Abby has also been working as the graduate assistant for the Center on Community Philanthropy. During her time here, she's been assisting myself and Dr. Basil, who'll be doing his presentation on a research project that we've been doing looking at nonprofits and sustainability. She's also been working with us on all of our community um, conversations on race, our community philanthropy projects, and overall she's just been an astounding public service student during her time here. So please join me in welcoming Abby Olivier. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and thank you, everybody, for joining, joining us today at your lunch hour to hear Dr. Basil. New urbanism is a steadily growing trend where folks are finding that it's pretty nice to walk to school, the grocery store, and the barber shop. These planned communities are not only in suburban settings, but in denser downtown neighborhoods where every sidewalk, every storefront is strategically placed in order to make restrict, restricted places more livable. In Dr. Carl Basil's book, Back to the Future, New Urbanism and the Rise of Neo-Traditionalism in Urban Planning, he explores new, urban, new urbanism revitalization in the context of public policy trends such as regional governance and the role of nonprofits. He compares planned communities in suburban areas with those in urban areas and features a case study of one of the first communities in the U.S. to receive federal revitalization money in Louisville, Kentucky. Dr. Basil received his PhD in Urban and Public Affairs from the University of Louisville, where he specialized in organizational administration. He is an associate professor and graduate program director in the Department of Public Administration and Health Management at Indiana University, Kokomo. His research interests include new urbanism, economic development, nonprofit management, executive succession planning, civil society, and organizational sustainability. He has worked with the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at Indiana University, and as Dr. Williams may have mentioned, he was a visiting scholar at the Center on Community Philanthropy in 2009. We're pleased to have Dr. Basil back to Little Rock along with his family, a full set of supporters. Um, so please help me join in welcoming Dr. Basil. Hi, thank you very much. And, um, I want to thank a few people, and I probably won't cover everybody, but uh, as uh, Dr. Williams stated, I actually started here fall 2009 as a uh, visiting fellow with the uh, Center on uh, Community Philanthropy. So it really has been an honor to uh, work with Dr. Williams. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, we're very good friends. And um, we also, uh, she also does a great job of picking graduate research assistants. So thank you very much, uh, Abby Olivier, for uh, all the hard work that you've done uh, with us. Um, also wanted to um, thank some other people, have uh, family members here, uh, friends. Uh, also have some uh, IU students. And as uh, people from Arkansas, you probably know as little about us as you do uh, uh, Indiana, but um, you probably have heard of uh, Hoosiers, so a very famous movie. And uh, if you watch basketball, you probably know about Hoosier, Hoosier Nation. Uh, there's a lot of different definitions of what a Hoosier is, and I think one of my favorites. And I could say this as a outsider somewhat, I grew up in Los Angeles County, uh, is that a Hoosier is somebody from Kentucky that's lost. <laughs> so that, that's one of my favorite. There's probably about 20 or 30 other definitions, but I think that's my favorite. Uh, so thank you very much. I think there's about five Indiana University students here. Uh, saw them a little bit later last night, so I'm just glad that they're here this morning. So, All right, and we'll get started on new urbanism. So new urbanism 
is a term, and I will be very frank, it's a term that uh, when I present about new urbanism at academic conferences uh, or with city planners, there's a lot of people that um, uh, don't really um, maybe appreciate and understand new urbanism. Some people think that all oh, this just has to do with what's happening with suburban development. So a lot of times when I ask people about new urbanism, uh, they may say, if they know anything about it, oh, well, I've been to Seaside. Uh, well, Seaside is nice, and it was the first new urbanist community, but uh, it's been adapted, the model has been adapted uh, in lots of different ways over the last 30 years. So Seaside started late 1970s. Over the last 30 years, uh, has developed and it's evolved in many ways. Uh, what I want to do, and uh, I will have to give credit to my co-editor and other co-authors of this book, what we saw was that the best way to treat the subject matter was to really look at case studies because it manifests itself in so many different ways. So the front cover of the book, uh, that's where I'm living right now. Uh, so my wife and I, we built our own house in a new urbanist community uh, just north of Indiana. And I'll make fun of Indiana a little bit more. Uh, Indiana, what I have figured out is normally after the rest of the world figure it, figures out what's a good idea, after that it happens in Indiana. So when I actually saw this was right around 1998-1999, uh, Village of West Clay was uh, being uh, initiated uh, right outside of Indianapolis. I said, well, this must really be a trend. And. The principles of new urbanism. Uh, what I'll do is I'm going to use uh, the writings of uh, Lewis Mumford and Jake, Gene Jacobs in order to ex explain how we got to this point. Um, because new urbanism really is something that has evolved uh, over probably about three decades, but even before that, uh, there were uh, two individuals, uh, Lewis Mumford and Jane Jacobs. Uh, so Lewis Mumford wrote a very long book, 657 pages, called The City in History in 1961. That same year, Jane Jacobs wrote a book called The Death and Life of American Cities. Mumford ended up getting the Best Book Award, but Jane Jacobs' book sold more copies. A lot of different reasons for that. Uh, one, uh, probably had to do with the fact, this sounds a little crass, uh, 657 pages compared to about 300. A lot of people said, oh, yeah, that book's a little bit too long for me. Uh, but I think another reason was Jane Jacobs uh, was newcomer on the field, and I think that her writing style, I mean, she really uh, appreciated and embraced a lot of the messiness of city. She said, what's happening in New York City right now is just fine, and I think what New York City is trying to do as far as developing an interstate system and in many ways displacing people by forcing people out of their homes uh, and in many cases really not giving them a equal place to live. You know, granted in many cases they were given some subsidy to relocate, but you know, the interstate system, highway system, basically the modern cities that we see today, uh, they came at a cost, they came at a price to millions of people. Jane Jacobs and Lewis Mufford, they're probably some of the first individuals to notice this in 1961. And out of that, new urbanism evolved. So a lot of new urbanism, as you could probably guess from the title, new urbanism, sometimes it goes by neo-traditionalism, traditional town planning. It goes back to what were communities like before when people actually did walk around, you knew who your neighbors were, and you weren't as dependent on the automobile. So a lot of it is going back from whence we came. So in the spirit of Lewis Mumford, Lewis Mumford in his almost 700 page book, and nice thing about it, I'm not trying to discourage you from getting it. It really is a good read. There's a lot of pictures, if you just want to go through the pictures. Um, he goes through what happens over a 10,000 year time period with regard to city development and what led us 
to this point where uh, we are so dependent upon automobiles. And what are we destroying in the process by putting in a huge interstate and not allowing people to actually walk to where uh, they work, which is how through most of human history, that's what people did. Got up in the morning, walked out to the field. Later on, you actually walked to the factory or maybe you took public transportation there, a streetcar. So the cities in many ways uh, completely, uh, it was more than a evolution, it was a revolution. Really radically changed the way that cities were. So if you look at that, the first cities, and what were some of the benefits for the way that people designed them? So some of the first cities, you would look at Mesopotamia, uh, Egypt, uh, India, and for the sake of this discussion, and in looking, really revisiting what Lewis Mumford did. Lewis Mumford was looking predominantly at uh, Egypt and then the Greeks. So this is a uh, picture of the uh, temples of Karnak at Luxor. So this is uh, right in the heart of the Nile River. And the Egyptians were known for building on a very grand scale. One reason why they did that was it was a uh, dictatorship, a uh, autocracy. Uh, so you had uh, one king who was considered to be God and uh, everything was for his pleasure. You know, that isn't saying that village life was, uh, you know, unpleasant in many ways. Uh, what historians have found out is that uh, it really wasn't a uh, slaves that built a lot of the uh, temples or the pyramids, it really ended up being a lot of the farmers during the wet season. So the Nile River Valley would flood every year. Well, what do you do with that population when the river's flooded? Uh, the uh, pharaohs in their infinite wisdom said, okay, we need to keep these people occupied. Let's have them build temples. Let's have them build pyramids. So. In not every case, but in a lot of cases, it really was paid labor. So you had people that lived in villages outside of these temples, and they perfected the uh, craft of uh, masonry, uh, stone cutting, whatever it is. Uh, and probably the amazing thing when you go to Egypt is you actually see that all this was done without pulleys or uh, without a pulley system. It's just amazing. Let's go forward about a thousand years. Look at Greek civilization. And whether it was Mumford or Jacobs, they probably wanted to emulate uh, Greek society more than they did the Egyptians or the Romans. One reason behind that was you look at uh, democratic uh, principles, the Greeks definitely embraced that a lot more than the Romans or the uh, Egypt Egyptians did, obviously. So uh, another reason why in the United States, we really embrace that Greek tradition, or at least we try to, uh, more than an Egyptian or a Roman one. And a lot of the reason why democracy evolved, it wasn't just a good idea. It evolved uh, with regard to uh, economics and geography. And I'll even go back so you can appreciate this. If you go to Egypt, you really have uh, areas that are along a very flat plain along a riverbed. So you don't have a lot of confinements with regard to geography. Ancient Greece, this is what you're building in. You're building around mountains, around cliffs, so you're really confined in what you can build. So I guess my first impression of going to Greece is, especially after going to Egypt, I was thinking, man, the Greeks, their building just seemed so tiny. The reason why they were so tiny was they were having to essentially uh, uh, build into the side of a mountain in order to make their temples. So they had some uh, confinements that the Egyptians didn't have, the Romans didn't have to some degree. Going through a lot of history here. This is where I do want to bring up some of the principles of new urbanism. So essentially what the new urbanists wanted to do was, what was life like when we had uh, 
Greek villages and what happened at the turn of the century before cars, uh, where you actually knew who your neighbor was. Uh, pollution rates were a lot lower to some degree. So this is uh, Cherokee Triangle. This is a historical preservation neighborhood uh, in Louisville, east side of Louisville. And something that I want you to notice about this picture is neighborhood that was built 100 years ago, almost all neighborhoods uh, had sidewalks. So a lot of people that lived here, uh, they were walking to work, or if uh, you could afford it, you were taking a streetcar to work. So this is a pre-automotive city. And there's a saying, if you go to um, England, if you go to Oxford or Cambridge, there's a saying that the backs are just as nice as the fronts because they have those beautiful gardens in the back of uh, cathedrals or the um, college campuses. And a lot of these historical neighborhoods, the backs aren't quite as nice as the fronts, but at least they are nice. So if you look at what's in the back, you have an alleyway. And something that uh, we really uh, got away from in building sub suburbs was we eliminated alleys. And you even think of a lot of stereotypes that we have of alleys. Uh, you probably heard the saying, you wouldn't want to meet him at the end of a dark alley. So alleys were looked upon as being um, places that were uh, dangerous, places that were dirty. You look at this alleyway, actually alleys serve many different purposes. And I think uh, we uh, forgot a lot of those purposes. Uh, uh, often they ended up being safer because it's easier for, uh, if you have a fire in your house, any, it's, you have access to the back of the house as well as the front of the house. And even aesthetically, this is where your trash goes. This is where you park your car. So you put things that you wouldn't want your neighbors to see in the back of the house. So that way, front of the house looks like this. So you may ask yourself, how did we get away from living in these compact communities where you would see your neighbors, uh, probably also noticed with this neighborhood, big front porches so you would actually be able to see your neighbors, you'd be able to walk on the street and automobile automobile traffic was looked upon as being secondary, not primary. This is one of the reasons. This is Lower East Side at the turn of the century. So this is what our grandparents, great-grandparents were trying to get away from for the most part. So at the turn of the century, if you ask most individuals, do you like where you live? Do you like living in the middle of the city? Most people would say no, because look at how the city looks. It's, it's messy, it's congested. Uh, people hang their laundry over their balcony, so it wasn't looked upon as being a desirable place. Uh, something else that was happening, turn of the century, whether you lived in um, England, United States, in Europe, we were industrializing like crazy, especially in this country. So cities were looked upon as being very dirty, smelly places. They weren't looked upon as being um, desirable to live in. So it really makes a lot of sense that people would want to move away from neighborhoods like this and move out to the suburbs. And I think a lot of this is captured quite well in a quote by Henry Ford in 1923, he said, we will solve the city's problems by moving away from the city. And you think about what Detroit looks like today. Hey, it's been happening for decades. People have been moving out of the city, so it looks like a donut. Uh, very little infrastructure capital in the city right now, but uh, actually the suburbs of Detroit are doing quite well. Well, that didn't happen overnight. That's happened over decades. Henry Ford saw it in the 1920s, he had a very simple solution, I think a bad solution, but still a lot of Americans embrace that idea. So now that you've seen what Mumford talked about, what he saw as being an ideal, 
And I would say that Jane Jacobs even took it a step further because Mumford, uh, in many ways, he was a idea person. Jacobs was a lot more pragmatic in her thinking. So Jacobs said, what we need to do is we need to prevent the federal government and state governments from displacing people from their homes. If you look at most neighborhoods that are being destroyed by interstates and highways, quality of life, you know, it may not be, uh, you know, the, the best, it may not be ideal in a lot of ways, but still, people have pretty decent jobs, uh, people are able to uh, get to work. Um, so it was looked upon as being something that was definitely a lot more tolerable than what happened later on. So this was during the time where uh, the federal government was tearing down a lot of those neighborhoods that they said were slums and they were putting in housing projects. So one of the problems with looking at new urbanism is I think there is a misnomer that this is just something for um, suburban communities. So just places for like Seaside, Village of West Clay and Carmel and uh, people forget that a lot of what happened in the 1990s is really come full circle today with regard to the way that federal government sees this and what needs to be done with neighborhoods. So most articles at this point really look upon what's happening in the suburbs with new urbanism. So what are we doing in order to try to recreate that sense of community, um, better transportation? What are we doing uh, for that? It's big emphasis is the suburbs. It's only been recently in some of the work that I think is probably some of the best work by Larson, Gard, and White, 2007 has really emphasized what's happening with revitalization product, projects. And what I want to show you in later on is that um, there's probably more commonalities than there are differences between what's happening with suburban development, with new urbanism, and what's happening with inner city development. And a lot of this comes back to what happened uh, during the Clinton administration. So I think um, Bill Clinton was ahead of his time in saying, what are we going to do with the inner city? What are we going to do with trying to revitalize some of these uh, neighborhoods? Uh, so he saw that it was as much of a matter of uh, economics, and economics was definitely tied into where people were living. So. Uh, he worked in tandem with uh, HUD Secretary uh, Henry Cisneros in 1996 to start the Charter on New Urbanism. And this Charter on New Urbanism catalyzed a lot of what we see as a model for developing inner city neighborhoods. So uh, the federal government has really been out of the business of building ha housing projects for at least three decades. In most cases, they're tearing down those housing projects or trying to and putting in communities uh, they, that are new urbanist. And this shows you some of the growth that's happened with regard to um, new urbanist development. So as you can see from these numbers, most of the development in all fairness ends up being greenfield projects. So it ends up being in the suburbs. So, 43% is in the suburbs, but you still see a growing number uh, that are in um, brownfield reuses. So um, you do have quite a, um, quite a mix, oh, I'm sorry, it's 57% greenfield projects, 43% um, urban revitalization. Um, but still, those numbers are closer than what a lot of people would think. And rationale for this, well, a lot of it has to do with aging of the baby boomers. So if you look at what are some of the ideals with new urbanism, many ways it has to do with where people want to live through the course of their life. What age are most people? Well, we have an aging population. Uh, most people that are in their 60s and 70s um, are saying, well, do I really want to still be on two acres of land? Do I want to be an acre of land? Um, 
you have a lot of people that are empty nesters that when you ask them and ask them honestly, where would you want to be? Uh, many would say, I would want to downsize. I want to be in a smaller place that's easier to maintain. And in many cases, they want to be around their grandkids. They want to be around their family. The advantage of living in a new urbanist neighborhood is you could be in a community that has mixed use. Mixed use as well as mixed housing. So you have um, homes that are built uh, right next to condominiums, right next to apartments. And that way you literally can have potentially three generations that live in the same neighborhood. So you look through the course of human history, that's the way that it has evolved for the most part. It really is a very recent phenomena that you have nuclear families living far away from grandparents, great-grandparents. In addition to that, you have the aging of the baby boomers, baby boomers, uh, and questionnaires have said, and you know, like a lot of this work, uh, and to the credit of the uh, Census Bureau, they're collecting a lot of this data now, so we can study in a little bit more detail. Um, a lot of empty nesters are saying, this is what we desire the most. In addition to that, you have an increasing number of people that are staying single longer or people that are single. So the single population in the United States has gone up exponentially in addition to the number of people that um, are, are single in general. So you have all three of those trends that have converged and for that reason uh, you have an increased demand for living in a high density neighborhood. And as you can imagine, historical preservation is really linked to this. So a lot of people that have said, well, uh, I don't necessarily want to live in a uh, older community and an older home where I have to do a lot of repair work. Is there something like this that's newer construction uh, that's easier to maintain? Uh, so that's another reason why you have increased demand for living in new urbanist communities. And 10 chapters in the book, the one that I want to focus on the most was probably one of the more difficult areas for us to get a sense of, and that's business development in new urbanist communities. So ideally, with new urbanism, you're going to have quality architecture, uh, you're going to have accessibility. So accessibility with regard to uh, being able to um, walk down the street, have walking paths, but you're also going to have accessibility um, around your house. So a big part of it will be alleyways. Um, another part of new urbanism has to do with mixed income. So in the case of Village West Clay where I live, uh, yes, you do have homes that are worth three, four million. Well, maybe not necessarily today, but when they were built, you know, this. Uh, that, that was definitely the going price. So you have homes that are worth mil millions, but you could also get a condominium for 60000 So you have mixed income. Something else that you have is you have mixed use. Mixed use essentially means that you have businesses that are within a residential community. And the whole irony of that is that in vast majority of communities, and it probably is true with uh, Arkansas in Indiana, definitely is true, you have a local ordinance or local ordinances in a lot of communities that say you can't have a business within a residential area. If you think about it, it's like, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, a lot of this goes back to uh, the industrial age in the United States that picture of the lowest Lower East Side in Manhattan where people said, hey, cities are dirty places and I don't want uh, to have factories right next to where I live. So it made a lot of sense, turn of the century America. Doesn't make a lot of sense today because what's happening to most factories? The number of factories in the United States has 
really gone down. Most of the industry, even with factories, ends up being a lot cleaner. So we don't have the same rates of pollution, don't have the same rates of undesirable living in having factories uh, or businesses in close proximity to where people live. So in looking at business development in new urbanist communities, we are looking at um, five different settings. So we had um, two greenfield developments. So this first area of Village West Clay, uh, where I live, that's greenfield development in the suburbs. Uh, Celebration, has anybody been to uh, Celebration in uh, Florida? That's okay, it's people are raising their hands. So that's a greenfield development. I, I almost put it in as a uh, tourism site um, because it is Disney after all, but the reason why I didn't is the fact that if you go to Celebration, most people live there all year round. So Michael Eisner, I think this was a decent idea for CEO of Disney, he said, I want to build um, affordable and quality, high quality of life uh, housing for uh, people that work for Disney. So if you've been to Celebration, you have you know, not only um, homes in tandem with businesses, uh, at one point they actually had their own school system. In addition to having their own school system, they also have a hospital right there. So very comparable. Our, uh, our neighborhood doesn't have that, but um, I can't say that uh, we have a dentist office in our neighborhood. Um, I had uh, three wisdom teeth pulled and I was able to walk home. My wife, I think, thought oh, it's crazy, but you can do that in a new urbanist community. I mean, you have those kind of businesses right next to your residence. So Village of West Clay, Celebration, those are our greenfield developments. Um, Norton Commons was as well, but then we have um, two um, inner city developments, um, Park Duval and Duneland Village. Park Duval was uh, west side of Louisville, and this was one of the first um, revitalization projects right after that charter of new urbanism in 1996 and Duneland, Duneland Village is right outside of Gary, Indiana. So if you look at median family income, quite a big difference between these. And also when you look at percentage below the poverty line, a lot of differences as well. So. When you look at these first stats, you're like, okay, what do these places have in common? This is what they have in common. This is Village of West Clay, suburban greenfield development. That's Park Duval. That's a revitalization project in Louisville. They look similar, so I think they do. So when you look at the design of the architecture, very similar in the way that it's high density development, meaning that you have a lot more people living there than you would a traditional suburb. Sidewalks in the front, alleyways in the back. You notice uh, you have like big porches where you could actually talk to your neighbors. This is what Park Duval looked like 10 years prior to this being built. The uh, upper uh, right hand corner, uh, that's a uh, closed businesses, almost all the businesses were closed. Right hand side, you could tell that at one time, Park Duval was a very desirable neighborhood. One of the reasons why HUD in tandem with the um, mayor of the city of Louisville um, as well as um, a nonprofit developer said there is potential here for redevelopment because this was a African-American community that had been around for decades and what ended up happening was when uh, housing discrimination laws uh, were being taken off the books in the 1960s which 
everybody would hopefully agree was a great thing. Uh, it was horrible that it was there in the first place. There was actually a negative byproduct. One of, one of the problems was you had a lot of professionals in those communities that ended up moving to the suburbs. So at one point you had uh, African American doctors, attorneys that were actually living in close proximity to people that had more blue collar jobs. After you had professional people, uh, whites and blacks moving out to the suburbs, this is then what happened. A lot of those neighborhoods lost their capital. They lost uh, economic capital, but they also lost what we would say is social capital. They lost professionals that actually were a part of um, boards and were involved in the school system. They ended up going to the suburbs where they saw the schools as being superior. So this is what Park Duval looked like as far as the residents. So no businesses or very few to uh, be talked about and you had housing projects. And really within a five year time period, you had crime rates in areas like Park Duval and Dewland Village, uh, they had crime rates go down exponentially. You had crime rates that literally went down by 60% within a five year time period. So economically, these areas ended up being more viable, but uh, crime rates were going down. Uh, so you had uh, businesses coming in and everything was related. It, you had a lot of synergies resulting from uh, the uh, federal government working in tandem with private developers, private nonprofit developers, in targeting Park Duval, Dewland Village for revitalization. And I tried to be very intentional with all my stories. So when I was talking about getting my wisdom teeth pulled, walking home, the reason why I used healthcare businesses as an example. Uh, a commonality that we saw between suburban, new urban sites, and inner city ones what had to do with the fact that the most viable businesses ended up being in the health services sector. That manifests itself in uh, area, uh, ventures that are as large as uh, hospitals and as small as dentist offices or um, public health facilities. So Park Duval, um, before the neighborhood was targeted for revitalization, you would have to take a bus and a lot of times you couldn't get a direct bus route to a healthcare facility. After revitalization, this is how it looks. They put it in a big community health center and it's right next to condominiums and apartment buildings. So those of you that uh, a lot of students are probably looking at access to health care because of health care reform, uh, that's really, really one of the biggest dilemmas uh, that we're facing is that quality health care, you have to have access to it. So economic development in the form of, in form of new urbanist development can result in better healthcare outcomes. So in looking at the businesses that are open and the ones that are closed in these developments, we also saw a lot of commonalities. So in this case, we we're looking at um, everything from uh, barber shops and beauty salons uh, down to restaurants and grocery stores. And if you don't want to look at the numbers, this is where I uh, have another wonderful GRA that did a lot of these tables and charts for me, uh, Brandy Kaiser at Indiana University. Uh, just look at uh, the black portion, it has to do with professional development, financial services, and uh, healthcare. So you look at commonalities in the businesses that have stayed open over a 10 year time period. So we are looking at uh, 2001 through 2011 in all five of these communities. The businesses that had the greatest amount of sustainability were the ones that were professionally oriented, 
and ones that were in the healthcare sector. Now compare that to ones that closed operation. Each one of these communities had at least one restaurant, and this is surprising to all of us that did this research. Grocery stores, you would think that that would be one of the best businesses to have in one of these communities. And I know this happens to me all the time. I'm the one in my family, and uh, my wife and daughter will attest to this. Um, I'm the one that's having to go out and do these late night grocery runs. So I used to love it when we had a grocery store in our neighborhood. We've actually had two go out of business just in 10 years. One of the reasons that we saw not only in Village of West Clay, but Park Duval, Duneland Village, was a lot of people that ended up owning these grocery stores thought, oh, this is a new urbanist community. They thought this not only in the suburbs, but they thought this with the city development projects. People can pay more. So they would inflate the prices, and subsequently these stores, people stopped going there. They said, well, and here's the contradiction. People may live in new urbanist communities, they may like to walk, but they still have cars. They'll drive three minutes away, four minutes away to go to Walmart uh, and pay a much better price and I hate to say it, sometimes get the same product. So we saw that whether it was Village of West Clay or Park Duval. Restaurants, grocery stores, overpriced goods. And subsequently that was the reason that uh, residents were saying, in addition to the um, uh, developers, that they ended up going out of business. So we did see a lot of commonalities. If you're going to put a business in a new urbanist site, uh, which really is the ideal, you should be able to walk to those businesses and uh, I guess ideally, you would be able to walk to not only places where you're shopping, but if you could walk to where you work. A lot of these professional services, we had people that uh, lived in a neighborhood where they were a realtor. They lived in a neighborhood where they were a financial advisor. So they would have a business right there in the community. That's ideal. What we saw, and this is I think a pretty nuanced finding, was that suburban development, uh, they had a, uh, they probably had more, um, more potential for um, independent restaurants. So when I first started the study, and my co-authors I think would um, concur with me, we thought, well, in every case, we really want people that actually live in these communities to own their own businesses. So it would be independent businesses. We are pretty anti-chain. Well, as much as I hate to admit it, uh, probably one of the uh, more viable businesses in our neighborhood is HCVS. So I think these businesses, because they're not getting as much street traffic as um, other businesses, because it's right in the middle of a residential community, um, you have to either live there or you have to know people that live there in order to frequent those businesses. Well. Because of that, the CVS's, the Walmarts of the world, um, well, Walmart isn't here, but um, uh, CVS's, Walgreens of the world, a lot of those, you know, like large pharmaceuticals or even chain restaurants, uh, they have the marketing ability to be in the middle of a residential community and get news about, out about their business. Somebody that's starting a new business just doesn't have the same level of resources. So, Chains, as you can imagine, fare a lot better in the redevelopment sites. It's hard enough to get zoning for a redevelopment site. It's even harder to attract businesses. So the more successful development uh, businesses in Park Duval and Dewland Village, uh, they ended up being chains. They ended up being chain restaurants, uh, chain financial services like H&R Block, those had the greatest level of sustainability. There's another irony that we found. One of the key principles of new urbanist development 
has to do with density. So new urbanist development, ideally, you're going to have more people living in a smaller space. Now, when I say that, it almost sounds like a recipe for disaster, but uh, the flip side is you really get to know your neighbors. So if you desire to live in this kind of community, uh, it really ends up being having a lot of good social byproducts to it. With the redevelopment sites, density ratings actually went down. Now, when you think about it, it makes sense because you were going from housing projects to residential communities. So you had fewer people uh, in, a, um, in a larger space when you actually put in condominiums and single family homes than you did when you just had high rise apartments. So there does seem to be a saturation point. You know, you can only uh, put so many people in one apartment complex um, before you start having the flip side higher crime rates. And when I asked the question to the uh, mayor of the city of Louisville, uh, Jerry Abramson, one of the big critics, critic, uh, criticisms of his new urbanist project, and he, he ran for re-election on what was happening in Park Duval and other developments. I said, well, what about gentrification? Were you actually displacing people from the Park Duval neighborhood to a place where uh, they couldn't afford to live or you, you really weren't taking care of everybody in that community? People were being displaced. And he said, well, yeah, you're, you're right. People were displaced, but I'm not in the business of warehousing the poor. So you look at what life was like before then, where we had the highest crime rates in the state of Kentucky. You look what it is now. So he said, yes, it, it wasn't a uh, perfect solution, um, but it definitely is a superior solution than what we were able to offer people in that neighborhood before. Some other similarities that go along with some of those basic principles of new urbanism. Struggles with developing commercial se sectors. So yes, in general, when, I, when we spoke to the um, developers of Park Duval or um, Village of West Clay, all said the same thing. They actually said that the residential development was so much easier than commercial development. So that was definitely a commonality. Mixed use development. So in all these uh, cases, all five settings, they actually had businesses that remained viable over a 10 year time period uh, within a residential community. Architecture and neighborhood plans. If you looked at those pictures of Village West Clay in Park Duval, in many ways the architecture is very similar. Uh, there's a difference in the type of uh, construction materials. In Village of West Clay, you're using um, concrete mesh board. Uh, the name for that is Hardy Plank. In Park Duval, you're using vinyl siding. But you look at those pictures, looks like very decent affordable housing. Just vinyl is a lot more affordable than Hardy Plank would be. Intergenerational. Um, my wife and I, daughter, we um, meet people all the time. Uh, that uh, live in our neighborhood that have said, well, our grandparents live in this neighborhood too. And we saw that across the board. People were able to live next to their parents, their grandparents, uh, within the same community. And lastly, range of income. Something that was uh, stipulated with the Charter of New Urbanism was uh, that, yes, they realized the um, um, HUD realized this, private developers, that you were going to have some degree of displacement, uh, but there still was a mandate that uh, at least 40% of the people that live there had to continue to live there. So, I mean, I, it definitely is not ideal, but you couldn't have a displacement rate uh, that was over 70%. And I have to close, because we are at uh, the uh, Clint School. And when I was doing a fellowship here, 2009, uh, I actually had the privilege and honor of meeting uh, President Clint. And 
I'm glad that somebody was able to take this picture of me. This was one of my students. Um, but um, I am horrible about taking pictures of other people with the president. So my story that has to do with this is uh, one of our uh, GRAs, and um, she ended up going right up to President Clinton. And this seems so long ago. This was 2009 when people actually had real cameras. So she actually threw a real camera at me, and she said, Dr. Basil, take my picture with President Clinton. So I got as close as I could to him, point, click, flash in the go off. And President Clinton, what you hear about him as far as he uh, never forgets a face, he knows everybody's name, he knew who I was. So he goes, I'm sorry, Dr. Basil, the flash didn't go off. Would you mind taking that picture again? I said, well, of course, Mr. President, I can do just that. Point, click, doesn't go off. Then this hand comes out of no place, takes the camera out of my hand, point, click, Flash goes off, no problem. President Clinton looks down at me and says, I'm sorry, Dr. Basil, but Chris has been with me for a long time. That was one of his um, Secret Service guys. And Chris has been with me, and he takes pictures all the time. So I do apologize, but we need to get that picture done. Very last slide. I went from being at the Clinton School to something that I've been waiting to share, another story the silent partner for the development of our neighborhood. He's a man by the name of Tom Houston. If you go home, if you Google Tom Houston, what will come up is Nixon's enemy list. So one of the developers of our neighborhood was the guy that did all the uh, wiretapping and did all the spying for Nixon as a very young attorney. So I guess the lesson to be learned here is if your name is Mudd in Washington, D.C., you uh, move to Indiana and you become a housing developer. <laughs> and I'll go ahead and close at that point. We do have time for a couple questions. If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. There you go, Janet. Uh, my name is Jenna Rose. I'm a second year Clinton School student, and I'm also a concurrent student at UAMS um, as a Master of Public Health student. Um, and I have an extreme interest in the intersection between the built environment and um, health outcomes and um, health disparities. So bas basically health equity as it relates to the built environment. And um, in my projects that I've been working on, um, what I have seen is that the involvement of the community from day one yeah. is really what makes a difference. So could you speak to the um, the Charter of New Urbanism and how it, I guess, intentionally involves the people who are going to be displaced because, mm -hmm. as you said, 60% uh, yeah. um, potentially um, can be displaced. That's a lot of people, and those are real people with real lives, mm -hmm. and they tend yeah. to be poor and low income, um, and they're also are already disenfranchised. So um, what's the solution to that? So. Yeah. No, I, I think it's a very good question, and I think uh, as far as what was on paper, I mean, there were uh, committees that were stipulated as part of that charter, that you had to have residents in that community that actually sat on those committees. Um, but yes, uh, so the, yeah, there was involvement from people in the neighborhood, but uh, the flip side is that, yes, yeah, you uh, noticed from this presentation, you probably, it sounds like you're very familiar with the subject matter. Um, Unfortunately, this isn't a perfect solution. I think what probably needs to happen is we need to find ways that we're going to emulate this model in as many neighborhoods as we possibly can. Um, because you're absolutely right that even though on paper people were involved, there were committees to try to prevent displacement, uh, it still happened. And what we found as researchers, so myself, my co-editor, uh, a lot of the other book chapters across the board, uh, was that uh, there aren't good mechanisms in place for tracking the people that were displaced. And you're just shifting the problem. So the crime that was yeah. here now goes somewhere else. So you're just, and then you're, you get racial segregation, and you're really just amplifying the problem mm -hmm. of the communities. So, yeah. No. Yeah, I, I agree. And when I interviewed the mayor, and I even brought up that question with him, uh, what he did say is that, in, you know, to his credit, uh, they actually started a, another community just like Park Duval that was in close proximity to University of Louisville. 
And if you've been around Louisville, you know it's a very segregated city. Uh, east side is predominantly white, west side is predominantly black. And unfortunately, over decades, very few resources have been put up into the west side of Louisville. Um, but he was able to start another community, basically the same thing, tore down old housing projects, put in new development, uh, but in the case of the one around University of Louisville, he put in more apartments and condominiums than they did single family housing. What they found, and this goes along with the demographics, there's just a greater demand for that type of housing. Uh, so if you look at foreclosure rates in Park Duval, uh, they actually have gone up higher, as you could imagine, with the single family homes than they have condominiums. Last one, right there. Uh, right, come behind you, there's a microphone. Hi, uh, Vicki Edwards at uh, the UALR Institute of Government. Okay. I was curious as to whether you saw any differences uh, in terms of you know, outcomes based on the impetus for uh, the redevelopment. Mm -hmm. So for example, you mentioned Celebration is basically a company town yes. versus say a university that goes in. I know Mercer University was very active in redeveloping uh, the areas around it in Macon, Georgia, uh, versus some you know city-oriented uh, approaches or even grassroots approaches. Mm -hmm. yeah. And let me hear that, just that last part of your question again. But, you know, where, you know, did you notice any difference in the outcomes based off of the impetus for the, the redevelopment? Okay. Yeah, I would say as far as, uh, you know, the outcomes, as you can imagine, were very distinct between greenfield development and the inner city. So really, probably one of the primary outcomes for the uh, redevelopment sites was to reduce right crime rate. Uh, and they were able to do just that. Um, but going back to the first question, well, to what degree did they really do that? Were they uh, actually uh, reducing crime rates overall or were they just moving the problem to a different place in the city? Uh, so I would say that, um, um, yes, crime rates did go down. Um, as far as like general outcomes with um, economic development, and I had some charts, I think I went over it pretty quick, but when you looked at um, family, median family income, which was another outcome, uh, median family incomes in each one of these five um, areas uh, did go up by at least 20%. Uh, and there really wasn't a big difference, so whether it was Village West Clay or Park Duval. Median family incomes were going up, and you know, one of the uh, compelling findings of that was it had to do with the fact that people in those areas were actually given incentives as well as support to own their own businesses. So you had people that uh, really didn't have a um, substantial means to support themselves uh, and they were given um, small business loans uh, as well as other incentives to actually open up a barbershop in the neighborhood or open up a restaurant. So economically, uh, yes, uh, I would say in each of those five areas, uh, they were able to meet uh, outcomes. But crime rate, which ironically, that was probably one of the uh, more, uh, that, that was a primary outcome they were looking at. Um, I think the jury is still out on that. Two quick notes before we close. Uh, Mary Dobbs, thank you for coming from the city of Bryant. She's been involved in, in some of these uh, issues and she actually helped us with the program next week, next Thursday at 10 Principles of Building Healthy Places. And you can come to that next Thursday. And then next Monday, we as well have another program on neurourbanism, a panel discussion that we're hosting with Hendricks College. And they'll be doing a tour afterwards of a, a neighborhood uh, community that was being founded on these principles. So thank all of you for coming. Dr. Basil, thank you. Welcome back. He'll be uh, over here signing copies of his book as well if you would like to attend that. Thanks so much. All right.